I'm here to talk about Lake in the Hills Fen Nature Preserve. I'm currently the steward there, which means that I muster up the other volunteers to go work. <laughs> and then I get to see the beautiful things that they accomplish. So I've been a volunteer there since the late 80s, so I have a long history with the place. But before we dive in and actually talk about the Fen, I want to describe myself because you will be surprised at how I ended up as a steward of an H preserve. I have academic training in music. My first job was after a bachelor's and a master's degree from Northwestern's music school. And my first job was as a junior high school band director. Here are my kids in 1974. Um, believe it or not, there are several of them that still are in touch with me. We exchange Christmas cards, and they tell me how much playing in band affected them. And it isn't because they went on to careers in music. It's because they had a sense of what it means to really accomplish something with a group, to work hard and to strive for excellence. So after I was at, at the junior high for a while, eventually I was the very first band director at Streamwood High School when it opened in 1978. And here we are after we finally got our uniforms in 1979 at Northwestern Band Day. As I say, we're in there somewhere, not too sure. After some time at the high school, I went down to the University of Iowa where I worked on a PhD and I taught uh, in the music department. Here is a plaque about my dissertation, which won an award. And if you look, you can see that it was computer-based. So for my study, I learned how to com program computers at quite a high level. I used the precursor of the Wii controller to follow someone's conducting. It may look like conducting is <clears throat> quite fancy, but all of the fanciness is a matter of expression. The actual beat is a simple change from down to up. And so I programmed a synthesizer with, with music so that I follow the beat and, and the music played in times with someone's conducting. That research got the attention of a uh, fellow at the University of Iowa who was the head of a software development division that used uh, professors' ideas and the division was called Conduit, and we brought their ideas to life. So I did that for a while, and then that was noticed by a much larger organization. You may have heard of the company Pearson and Pearson Education, huge conglomerate based in England. I went to work for them, and I had a career as a computer software uh, programmer and designer until I retired. So how does that head into being a steward at a nature preserve. Well, I've had a lifelong interest in nature study. And believe it or not, I have proof. Here is a story I wrote for my first grade teacher, Miss Mogan. She had us write little stories every day as soon as we were able. So see spot, you know, look at Jane, those kind of stories. But by March, I was doing a little better. If you were in Dubuque, Iowa in those years, to see robins finally in March was a very big deal because the winters were cold and very snowy. So here I say on March 21st, I saw two robins fighting last night. I saw three robins one day and I saw one at my neighbor's last night too. I really didn't see it, I heard it singing. So at six years old, I'm birding by ear, and at 77, I still am. So uh, after that period of time that I was uh, at the University of Iowa, when I was working in the, as a computer programmer, neither the university nor Pearson cared where I was or when I worked, as long as I fulfilled my contracts. 
So around about uh, 1987, I moved back into my house in Lake in the Hills. And I noticed a, 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 an article in the paper that was offering a walk to be led by Wayne Shenham, who is a very noted naturalist and was getting, giving a, a, a walk at the Spring Hill Farm Fen, which, which is what Lake in the Hills Fen was known back in that time. I did not know Wayne. I did not know what a fen was, and, but I was intrigued. It seemed like a good idea to go check it out. So I did, and that was uh, the start of a 30-year friendship with Wayne, who had a PhD in biology, and he and many others that had the kind of experience that he has were my mentors during those years. So that's really how I learned about what, what managing a nature preserve is all about. So, what is a fen? The simplest definition would be it's a wetland fed by groundwater. The trick is to get the groundwater to be at the surface, not deep, because you want that groundwater to be interacting with the plants. So fens are almost always associated with some kind of uh, glacial structures like a came, an esker, moraines, and eroded glacial till. I'm going to show you photographs of all of those, so I won't really bother to explain them right now. But the lake in the hills has all of those except for a moraine, and we'll have a chance to see what that's about. I realize that this picture does not have enough detail for you to see much, but I wanted to give you the 180 degree panorama from a high hill overlooking Lake in the Hills Fen. So what we're going to do is we'll start over on the right-hand side and we'll chop up this image and look at bits of it to see what's, what's out there. Very, very over on the right, you see a fen, the water course, that's fairly near the little group that's touring. So here, look at the massive hill that's behind it. Rainwater has soaked through that hill and eventually come down to the point where it cut the modern water table. So the trick about Lake in the Hills Fen is it's in a deeply eroded valley. And I will show you the creek that at one time was the size probably of the Fox River, if not bigger, that eroded out that whole central valley. You can kind of see uh, the, the valley up in the... Uh, right hand upper top there where it looks like it's dived down. That's where the creek bed is, and it comes through the whole preserve. So moving on to the left, here's a continuation of the fen, the open water, and you see some of the massive hills off in the background. Here is a very interesting structure. Over on the left hand side at the top, you see those two hills that are kind of uh, sort of mushed together. There has been some mining there. Those two hills at one time were connected. That is an esker. An esker is a riverbed. What do we mean? It's a riverbed. It's up in the air. Well, imagine this river is in the glacier or at the surface of the glacier. And it, like all riverbeds, produces a riverbed. So the, this river has sand and gravel in it that are falling out and forming the riverbed. But then you melt the glacier away, and you're left with a long, sinuous line of gravel on the surface of our current earth, right? So that's an esker. So all of these interesting structures are out there. I'm going to show you the hill where I stood to take these pictures. This is a came, and we call it Dome Hill. Uh, it's, it's quite an amazing uh, pile of gravel. <clears throat> and, then, and a came can form at the front edge of the glacier where the sand and gravel will <clears throat> pour off, or it can be caused by a fissure in the glacier. And that fissure can then hold sand and gravel as it melts in, and then you melt it all away, and you're left with this um, big dome of, of, of gravel again an amazing place for water to percolate through to form the fens at the bottom. Here, thanks to Google Earth, 
is an overview of Lake in the Hills Fen. You can see the water course of the creek if you start in the upper left-hand side, and you can trace it through the valley until it exits down at the bottom on the right-hand side. What you can't tell in Google Earth is the tremendous difference in elevation uh, from the creek bed up to the hills along the side. Here, I can get my, oh boy, this is tricky. Um, here is this. I don't think I can do it. I was going to try to point to Dome Hill. Can you figure out where Dome Hill is? <laughs> For the folks at home, um, the screen that you're seeing is way over to my left, and I can't get in front of it to say exactly where, where we are on it. But anyway, um, Dome Hill is at the bottom, right above the word Google. There's a little square area of fairly short grass, and that is Dome Hill. Does that make sense? Could you see that? Great. Uh, I have enough of a studio audience here that I can see heads shaking. Thank you for that. So there is that, and then below Dome Hill, there is a little area of exposed gravel. Um, that is the fin that we were looking at in those first shots. So here is a diagram that helps us understand the fin and the, and the form uh, that the water takes as it percolates down through the gravel out into the fen, and on beyond into sedge meadows, and finally gets to the creek. So I'm going to read some of this because it's probably pretty small print, depending on what you're looking at the screen with. If you have a phone at home, it's probably not nearly big enough to, to read it. But fens are wetlands fed by mineral-rich groundwater flowing at or just beneath the surface. They're formed when rain falls on the hills and percolates through the gravelly soil before seeping out on the side or at the base of the hill. During this journey, the water becomes saturated with calcium compounds and turns alkaline. That's especially here true in our area where our soils are limestone gravel. Below that, we see a section about the hanging fan and the hanging fan is where the frog is and just to his uh, right. So if the water table is up on the side of the hill, if the erosion has been sufficient, the fin forms right up there on the side of the hill. And then the water continues down through the sedge meadow because it's lost a lot of its alkalinity by then and it becomes just a nice wet meadow and that's what the deer is standing in, a sedge meadow. So what we're going to do is look at a sequence of, of slides that take us up to the very top driest area, and we'll come down and see what the vegetation looked like in all of those various conditions. So first of all, we have the top of a dry hill. This is reliably what you would see on July 4th. There is a prairie coreopsis, the yellow flowers, and this is lead plant, one of our few prairie shrubs. It can withstand fire. Uh, it burns to the ground in a fire, but it comes right back up. But otherwise, each year it gets a little bit bigger, which is what shrubs do. Woody plants continue the next year from where they left off. So also up on the top of the hill, we have a short grass prairie. This is the prairie at the end of August or into September. The short grass prairie is similar to what you would see in Kansas or Oklahoma, but this very gravelly soil is so dry that that's the kind of vegetation that we have. Little blue stem grass, which is the sort of reddish grass, northern drop seed, tall bone set are the white flowers, and the little pink flowers are uh, button blazing star. Here's another shot up in that area of button blazing star with Indian grass. So once again, that's our highest elevation dry prairies. Sometimes they're called gravel prairies or gravel hills. Doesn't sound very encouraging, doesn't it? I'm going to go out and look at the gravel hills. 
but they are covered with some pretty neat vegetation. Coming down the slope, but still not to the fen yet, we have more mesic areas or medium uh, moisture, and then we get some of the bigger plants like these cone flowers, purple and yellow. Down a little farther, this big sunflower is cup plant, and the, uh, the, the lighter violet, pinkish violet flowers are a big mint called Menarda, and we've got some um, iron, uh, ironweed in there. And then these t real tall yellow flowers over on the far right hand side are basically huge dandelions. We call it wild lettuce. Okay, we're finally down to the point where we can have the water seep out because we're at the water table. So here is a close up of a hanging fin up on the hill. The water would be coming down from the right, little kind of like a V up in the corner and come down and it flows out the left. And the flowers in there have to be extremely tolerant of alkalinity. The pH in there has been measured. Uh, the state geologists come out often and measure it. And it's 7.8. When you consider that neutral is 7, that's really a super saturation of calcium. Here's another shot of the hanging fan. I'm getting a message here that says my internet connection is unstable. I hope that, that that doesn't affect us in the room, but I'm sorry for the Zoomers. Anyway, here we have the, the hanging fan coming from the mid-left and flowing down the hill toward the right. Again, very specialized flowers in there. Grass of Parnassus are the little white ones, and the yellow ones with the flattish top is Ohio goldenrod. We have over 500 species of plants on the plant inventory at Lake in the Hills Fen. So it's been a real uh, learning experience for me to master that, that flora. One more shot of the hanging fen. This is right at the upper edge of it where we have some beautiful uh, fringed gentians, the blue, the flat top goldenrod again, and another shrub known as shrubby sankfoil. The, the little yellow flowers in the foreground. This example shows us how extreme the alkalinity is. We call this a calcareous fin because of the constant supply of groundwater high in calcium or magnesium carbonates. Notice that on the edge of the leaves of this um, pedicularia, sometimes called lousewort, how it is exuding the calcium right along the edge of the leaf. That shows you how extreme it is. Continuing down past the fen now, the water has lost its alkalinity and it's flowing into a sedge meadow. And the sedge meadow even has a lot of peat in it, which is a bit acidic. So by this point, we're probably neutral pH. And so we get these gorgeous sedge meadows. The grass can be like a big blue stem and it can be tussock sedge and we have a nice mixture of, of flowers in there. This is dense blazing star, blooms in probably mid-June. We also have some uh, black-eyed Susans and uh, you get just sort of a nice overview of that. Here is a sedge meadow in September when the sunflowers bloom. Again, just amazing the, what the wet areas can produce. So finally, having come down from that very high dry prairie through the medium prairie, through the hanging fen, through the sedge meadow, we finally get to the creek. So it doesn't look like much now, maybe 10 feet wide. But again, you have to imagine that the size in, of, the, of a Fox River that would have eroded out that valley deeply enough to cause the fins along the sides of the hills. So I'd like to, to break with our scenic slides a little bit and talk about what it took to get the area preserved. You would think that what I've just showed you, having been discovered, would have been a no-brainer to set this aside. But that doesn't account for human greed. 
And so it actually was extremely difficult. In 1977, the state of Illinois embarked on a project, what they called the Natural Areas Inventory, where scientists looked at aerial photographs to try to find areas that appeared not to be developed. And they saw this area. And so they came out and looked at it. My friend Wayne Shenham was one of the ones who did. He talks about how frightened he was because he had heard about a hunter getting bogged down in one of the fens and trapped and lost his life. Well, it's a little bit not quite true. He had a heart attack. But anyway, I have been bogged down in them too and have been glad to have someone with me to pull me out. So, 1977, it's known. And the area came up for sale and Nature Conservancy bid on it. They wanted to buy it to get it started in their preservation. But they were outbid by material service, gravel mining company. So now we're in trouble. And through a tremendous amount of advocacy by Nature Conservancy and the McHenry County defenders, some of the, the defenders started a letter writing campaign to the governor. And um, it just went on for years. So a friend of mine, Don Pern, who was the first steward out there, put together a scrapbook that he kept for 10 years. And here it is. Now, I'm going to click through it. We're not going to try to read it. But it'll give you a sample of the, of the number of, of newspaper articles there were and the controversy that getting this saved, uh, you know, went through. So material service is now suing because uh, uh, some condemnation of, uh, you know, they want to be a part of this village so they can mine and Lake in the Hills and Crystal Lake are feuding about who's going to actually own the land. And it goes, you know, on and on. Municipalities battle to gain Spring Hill Fen. Um, loss of grant. Grants were offered to help buy it. And then because nobody could agree on things, the grants would expire. And this went on and on. Endangered grant. Crystal Lake, Lake in the Hills, bickering, cost grant. Poor Don was keeping track of all this, meanwhile knowing what's out there. Tale of two cities. Crystal Lake, Lake in the Hills, try to prosper without long rivalry. Well, the other controversy was that material service offered to donate the wetlands to Lake in the Hills, but they would mine the uplands. I have just shown you how critical it was to have the uplands so that the water, as it would soak through there, would become alkaline and produce the fens. So it was really fairly difficult to convince them that their idea was a non-starter. Conservation groups want more fen land. The conservationists knew that without, here's a conservationist say, fens needs buffer, of course. Without that, you're just not going to have the fens left. They might draw up, dry up or they would at least lose their alkaline characteristic. These are two early leaders. This is Jill Moreland. Um, she was the uh, uh, coordinator for Nature Conservancy of volunteers at that time, and she was the one who recruited me to start to volunteer out there. Um, we're going to see a picture of him in a minute. This is another very important leader in this time. Um, his name is Steve Packard, and he is the one here helping to set, set a fire. So at least material service did not prevent at this time people taking care of the place. They allowed people to go out there and burn it and to begin a, to get a sense of what was possible. So here we got fire is going on and this is all good and this guy's doing a fire. Here's Steve Packard again. Um, isn't this an amazing book? My gosh, unbelievable. Um, this is Alice Howenstein, still an active very elderly lady now, but still comes to a lot of meetings, very important conservation leader. Clicking through, this is talking about a real rare buttercup that is state endangered. 
there was a, a, a group that went out today to monitor them, and they still are finding them. We still have this endangered plant all these many years later. Here we go. Saturday, June 25th, 1988, 11 years after the natural area's inventory was complete, Spring Hill Fen saved. So here is what it took. Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund grant of 593000 combined with 740000 Build Illinois Natural Area Acquisition Funds. So to save you from doing the math, that's $1,333,000 was transferred to material service to buy out the gravel-rich areas uplands. Then, as they promised, they donated the wetlands to the village of Lake in the Hills. So the, the grant money in the uplands is now, now owned by the Illinois Department of Natural <coughs> Resources. So we had the basic 250 acres saved with the majority of the fens. Land acqu acquisition continued. Um, after a few years, we realized we needed even more buffer, so the state purchased more land around the edge. And an area over on the, on the west side, which was purchased by the uh, MCCD, the McHenry County Conservation District. So now we have three owners of this land. But fortunately, they cooperated and granted the Conservation District the authority to manage it all. So they are the authority that helps with the burns and helps me understand what needs to be done restoration-wise. So just because you have it saved and you have fabulous fens and some beautiful, extremely dry places, a lot of the mesic areas, the medium areas, look like that, full of fairly small trees and shrubs. It had been dairy farmed, but as soon as the cows left, these shrubs would, were able to come in because they, there was nothing trampling them down anymore. So now the restoration could be, begin in earnest. So this is an example of, of brush cutting. And the most important technique of all in managing a large acreage like this is, by the way, we have 500 acres now, is fire sometimes called the, the red buffalo. So big landscape fires like this are managed by the conservation district. They have the equipment and the personnel trained to know how to do it. Here's more of a close-up of a fire, and it does a really good job of cleansing out the shrubs. It will burn them right down to their roots. And if you do that every few years, you can keep them under control. Here is an example of a burn that we had, not this spring, but last spring. I walked out there shortly after this burn, and people I met on the trail were devastated. They thought, oh my, God, you burned this whole place up. We're, we're, the flowers are going to be gone, and the butterflies. Are... Here is the same picture taken the same spot 10 days later. That's how fast it comes back fire 10 days. So the fire is incredibly important. We still do have to cut some brush, but with these big landscape areas of, of management, uh, fire, etc., we're now on to more local kinds of management. Here we're collecting seeds. This is me. <laughs> so this was at the very beginning of the pandemic. We didn't quite know what to do about masks, so we, we wore masks everywhere, right? Probably a good idea. So we collect, if you were to have to buy it, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars of prairie seeds. And one of our efforts is to move the seeds around, take from the very far west side, put it on the east side, north to south, because one of our big challenges is genetic inbreeding of our plants because we don't have enough contiguous prairie in the area. So we need to try to mix up the genes as much as we can. 
Next, I'd like to move on to show you how you can explore more about the FEN and, and show you what the internet resources are that are available to you. There are two. There's a FEN website, lithfen.org, baconthehillsfen.org, and my website, it's just my name, davidschwegler.com. Um, thank you to Terry Campbell, our, our leader in the back room there, for leading me through what I could and couldn't do while doing a Zoom here. I would love to have just opened up a web browser and shown you these uh, websites. No can do with Zoom. It would probably cause it to crash. So what I've done is just taken some screenshots to show you what's there. She answered so many questions during the course of this last week. No, I can't show videos. No, I can't go out to the internet. But hey, it's working out. Uh, hopefully you're seeing some things that are going to help you appreciate the place. So moving on, this is the Lake in the Hills Fen website. And there are a number of tabs up here. We're going to look at the Where tab in a minute, and we're going to look at the Photo Album tab in a minute. Okay, so the Where tab offers you two maps. There's an entrance on the east at Barber Key Park and an interest on the west, owned by MCCD, on Jefferson Street. Let's look at the Barbara Key Park entrance. On the internet, this is a live map. It's just, you know, the, the street map that, that Google offers. And so you can use, you can go here on your phone and get directions to Barbara Key Park. Here is the creek that goes down through the middle. Barbara Key Park is along Pyatt Road. Parking lot is there, and you just can walk right. You'll see the prairie once you're in the parking lot. It's not hard to figure out how to get to it at all. Here is the map on the west side, Jefferson. Here's the stream going through the middle. So you can see you're now on the far west. These lines, indistinct lines here that are kind of bluish right off the street, are mowed trails. This is a restored prairie, not a nature reserve. It's a good place to take a dog for a walk. It's even wheelchair accessible in part because part of it is paved. So it's a great place to go to basically look at the flowers. It's a beautiful restoration packed with prairie flowers. So um, if you were to continue from there and go into the area that's in white, that's the nature reserve. There are no trails in there at all. If you wanted to see that, you really need to get in touch with me um, because you would, you would need a guide. On the other hand, um, Barbara Key Park, it doesn't show it here because the trails are very narrow, but there are mowed trails in here that would take you through the nature preserve and past the hanging fence. Dana has, has been on those trails and can attest for the fact that it takes you right up to some really fantastic places. So for a first visit, probably going to Barbara Key Park is the best. I mentioned that we would look at the, the photo gallery part. We would hit that tab. That actually takes you to my website. We're now at, Lake in the, at davidschwegler.com in the Lake in the Hills Fen photo gallery. And you can see that if you go there, you can see 127 images of critters birds, butterflies, etc. What is this? 472 images of the flora and landscapes, 93. So if, if you were to go there and then you, what you can do is you can back out using this, this uh, ribbon across the top to my homepage. And then you have a number of choices. Um, the photo galleries and video. Stock images is more for people who want to buy my images for use in magazines, etc. So if we go into the photo galleries, the, it's organized geographically. And I have over 5,000 images online that are organized ac across the United States, up into Canada, and even out to Hawaii. So once you would 
click on one of those, let's just take for an example the North Woods in the Midwest Gallery. You would come to this page, which looks like the Lake in the Hills fan page, where you can see 43 images of the critters, 216 flowers, and 189 landscapes. And here are all the places I took the pictures. These are, are links in blue that would take you to their website if they have one, and there's a brief description of how you would get there. If we then open up, for instance, um, one, of these, one of these, like the, the uh, fauna gallery, finally we come to the actual pictures. And what's important about these, it's, it says again, it refers you back to where they were taken, and even more important, it tells you when. It, so many people will go to expect uh, to see some beautiful spot that they saw online but that spot, the picture was taken in July, and they are there in September, or vice versa. So having the dates on these pictures is extremely helpful. Look at the swan over on the right, or even down at the bottom on the left, with the little signet. And think about when that picture was taken. Early June. That's when you'd have to be at the Sini Wildlife Refuge to see that. If we would hit the button on my website that says video, it will take you to my YouTube channel. So here, uh, over on the left, is a video about Lake and Hills Fen. It reprises a lot of what we're talking about tonight. But since it's a video, there's a lot more motion to it. There's actual video, and then there's a lot of zooming and panning. It also gives a, a really good description uh, that we went through, but you, as I say, you can see it, these things in motion. There's a tribute to Wayne Shenham. He unfortunately passed away last summer. And then next to it, if you want to know sort of what the extent of my ability is as a photographer, and you don't watch anything else here, I hope you'll watch In the Wild. The photography is from the Sonoran Desert, Death Valley, and Denali. But really, it comes alive because I, I, I collaborated with my nephew, who is a fantastic composer. He's also orchestra director at Nequa Valley High School in Naperville. I asked him to compose me some piece of symphonic music that would challenge me. And when he sent it to me, I could hardly believe it. Huge climaxes, whispering lows. And so it was a real challenge to put photographs with all of that in the wild. How you get there? Go to my website, davidschwigler.com, click on video, you come to this, this screen with the videos on. I have friends that live on the Big Island, so I know what it's like to live there. They like to, to travel. So they say, Dave, could you come over and house sit? You may think, well, that's a pretty easy gig, until you find out they have chickens, goats, um, uh, little orchards. It's kind of like a farmette. So there's quite a bit to it. Anyway, that's, that's the extent of the sort of like the formal presentation I have of the information I was just really determined to get to you. The next three sections are just pretty pictures of things that I am privileged to photograph because I'm out there doing my thing. I have been monitoring the birds, oh gosh, 30 years, I don't know, it seems like forever. And so I have had opportunities to see them close up. And here are some of, the, uh, some of the birds. We have what are called grassland birds, some of the most ones in decline, because there's not that much native grassland left. Look at this, spotted sandpiper. Why did I get this close? Any guesses from the audience in attendance? Hmm? Well, yeah, no, but not that long a telescope. This spotted sandpiper had a chick, and she wanted to distract me from finding her chick. So she pranced around, jumped up on this little uh, promontory boulder to get my attention. Didn't work. I saw the chick. But luckily, I was not a coyote. 
So isn't this amazing? This tiny little chick is already, already feeding itself. Unbelievable. And upright, look at the spindly little legs on it. Isn't that fantastic? So moving on from the spotted sandpiper, very common bird, red-winged blackbird. But I like the picture because of the uh, kind of intricate design. It's sitting in uh, uh, great angelica, this, this wonderful stalk that tends to be like six feet high by June. And that blackbird had a chance to get up and really make its presence known. We have a number of grassland birds that are very tiny. This one is fairly uh, rare in our area. It's called a clay-colored sparrow. They weren't supposed to nest in our area, but by documenting them during the nesting season, I was able to convince the authorities at Audubon that in fact we do have them nesting. And so they finally put it on the checklist that we can say we've got them. So here's the clay-colored sparrow singing. Now singing is a stretch. The clay-colored sparrow sounds like this, buzz, buzz, buzz. Very metronomic, buzz, buzz, buzz. Any birders here that have heard them? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Have I got it right? It's not, it's not alive. No, it is not. So that's the clay colored sparrow. So here's a bobolink, the opposite in terms of its singing ability. It sings on the wing the most melodic, beautiful, mellifluous spray of song that you could ever want to hear. So that's, that's a nice uh, treat when that, when that one starts to sing. Isn't this little guy cute? Grasshopper sparrow. What's grasshopper about it? It's song. I can't imitate that one because I'd have to sound like a grasshopper. It's, it just has that real high-pitched little buzz, exactly like a grasshopper. You can hardly believe it's coming from a bird. I'm sure it weighs less than an ounce. Here it is on a profile view, grasshopper sparrow and doing its little buzz. I was privileged over the years to have a lot of photographs in the Chicago Wilderness Magazine, including this cover of a Henslow's sparrow that I took at Lake in the Hell's Fen. Birders will tell you if they keep a checklist, a life list, that a Henslow sparrow is one that they have trouble getting on it. They are not common. They were on the state uh, list for quite a while, uh, threatened and endangered. And they sort of go on and off depending on how much grassland is available to them. But we have a lot of Henslow's sparrows. I remember I was training a new bird monitor and we went out with the first time with her and we went to a place where they were and all of this birding is done by ear because otherwise it's just a little brown bird flying away. You can't really tell what it is. So the Henslow Sparrow song sounds like this. Slip, slip, that's it. But when you hear it, it's quite distinctive and it really can punch through. So we stood there at our spot where we were to listen and we looked at each other and we said, I hear six. Do you hear six? Yes. We have a lot of Henslow's Sparrows. Here is a very interesting bird called a dick sissel. They have an amazing migration. They go all the way down into um, South America, so they're generally a little bit late coming back. Here it is in an elderberry. Here it is oh, right in my face. I couldn't believe how it let me get that close. Here is a tree swallow feeding young, and here is an eastern kingbird. So, I don't know, how are we doing on time? Can I have some advice? Oh, we have another five minutes. That's great. Because this next section I think is pretty interesting. The weird plants. I'm not going to show you the sunflowers and the coneflowers. Let's look at some carnivorous ones. The first one to look at is called a bladderwort. These little BB-shaped balls on here, we have to understand this is submerged. 
I have got it out of the water, laid it in a bowl with a white bottom so you could see it. I have not destroyed this plant. It has no roots. It just, it's, it just sits in the water. So I can put it back. These bladders are sort of tightly wound. And when an organism like a water flea touches it, they unscrew and they suck the water flea or whatever in. And that becomes the source of their nitrogen. They are living in this pH 7.8 water where it's very hard to get nutrition from the soil. We have these, and here is what it looks like when it's submerged. You see the little reddish going across uh, sort of at the top left there. And then there's another one below it. That is what you would see in the water. They bloom prolifically, usually in June. Then they're really easy to find. But when the blooms go by, then you're back, back looking at them under the water again. And here's one of them uh, that gives you a good sense of the size of it. We have another very interesting uh, couple of plants that are only on the west side. You would need to have me guide you to them. And they produce a hybrid. Here are the parents. This is a bottle gentian which lives in the sedge meadows and the fens, wetland. On the other side, over to the right, is a prairie gentian which lives in the dry prairie. If those two species of gentian are close enough together that a bumblebee can force its way into the bottle gentian, get some pollen, and fly it up to the prairie gentian, and it gets pollinated crossways like that, then you can get the hybrid gentian, which has got an opening, but not as open as the prairie gentian, but not as closed as the bottle gentian. This is an extremely rare hybrid. In the flora of the Chicago region, this huge book, he only had it listed for one place, and that was in Wisconsin. We just found these in uh, 2017. And there's a young woman now who's working on her master's starting in the fall at Northwestern, who intends to study these for her master's thesis. Oh, we got a few minutes left. Fabulous. Here are some really interesting insects, at least I think so. I'm not going to show you the huge butterflies. You've all seen monarchs and all that. But here's a nifty little grasshopper. I like the design of this. This is a common green darner, newly emerged before the, the wings have had a chance to really dry out and form yet. You understand that uh, dragonflies live a lot of their life in the water, and then they emerge and, and they start their adult life. And here is, I think, a really nifty picture of a violet dancer, tiny little damselfly, and I like that it is sitting on some thistle down because it has just a nice uh, little touch to it. Violet dancer. Here is an unusual bumblebee. It's called a red banded because of the, the bands on the rump there. Uh, th th these are actually fairly rare too, although when you see a field where they are, they, they, there tend to be quite a few of them. The next one you may have seen it may have actually landed on you. And, and wow, look at this thing. It is called a walking stick. Um, insects have six legs, one, two, three, four, five, six are up here, sort of parallel to the antenna, walking stick. This is a common one. This is the, the caterpillar of a monarch. But we all know that monarch caterpillars eat milkweed. Is that a milkweed? It doesn't look like one. It is. It's a world milkweed. The female monarch adult butterfly is able to detect milkweed even when it has a very, very different appearance. Somehow they have the ability to sense it with their feet and get the chemical signature of it. A little bit of a gross picture. This is a, a, a female pond hawk eating a bee. 
pond hawks, dragonflies in general are just tremendous predators and they can catch these other insects on the fly. So um, that's pretty much it. Yeah, no, I gotta get the one more in here before the bell rings. This is a, a nifty butterfly called a Baltimore checker spot. And what's, oh, look at the little bee coming in here. Get, to get some uh, nectar also. What's interesting about it is the female peppers this plant called turtle head. And as the caterpillars emerge from the eggs, they cooperate and make this web. How do they do that? Then they will gobble this thing up and fall down and spend the winter on the ground. And then they mature the following spring into the adult butterfly. A couple more thatch ants on the move about to make a new colony. Tiger moth caterpillar eating the flower of prairie smoke. And my last wildlife uh, slide, you know what this thing is? Moth. Yeah, yeah. Hummingbird moth. I have had people swear that they saw a hummingbird. Nope. Insect. Hummingbird moth. But it does have a lot of the same habits of the, of the bird. The wings go so fast I couldn't even freeze them with my camera. And then it's, it's sticking its proboscis into the flower to get some nectar. So there you go. That's my last slide. And I hope you come look at it for yourself. There's nothing that I can do here that would really show you what it's like to be out there in the midst of it. There are places where you can actually believe that there's no village around, where you can just see nothing. Right, Dana? Yeah. yeah. You got to go look at it. It's not that far. And I've shown you how you can figure out how to get there. All right? So that's all I got for you. Thank you.